recording now. So welcome for anybody watching this recording. This is the monthly coaching session on, where are we? 12th of May, 2020. And I'm here with Simon, who's a member of the XR UK self-organizing systems team with the Extinction Rebellion. So welcome, Simon. I'm here at your service to answer any questions you have around self-organizing, self-organizing systems and anything that's going on that you want to dig into. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so I, I did actually watch about 15, 20 minutes of the previous session that you did, just to get an understanding of kind of what you're doing here, and it was quite useful. Um, I'm wondering if how you feel about not necessarily talking specifically about self-organizing systems today, but talking about the coaching of self-organizing systems. Because that's kind of something, I mean, I am part of the coaching sub-circle in the self-organizing systems team, but so it's, it's kind of on my mind a lot. But I think that's one of the areas within that team that other, other people are really crying out for and we're not really getting done that well at the moment. So that's, that's kind of why I keep on thinking about it. Is, I mean, how do you feel about it? Sure super um maybe we could start then with just kind of basics a discussion around what coaching is slash should be um just maybe on its own and then specifically in relation to facilitation as well and what the differences are because i i kind of have an idea myself but it would be nice to hear from you what you mm. think that is Mm. That would be a good place to start with the distinction between facilitation on one hand and coaching on another. And in a self-organizing system like holacracy or maybe sociocracy or where like the one that the Extinction Rebellion in the UK has, where there, there is a, a written down set of rules around how meetings work mm. and um, a set of processes for doing that then the role of the facilitator can be thought of as something like a referee, mm. uh, a, a neutral person who's coming in saying, here's what the rules are for how this meeting works. And my role here is simply to help you follow the rules and to keep the rules and to keep the boundaries. And a facilitator doesn't really do any more than that. So, you know, when there's a meeting process where there, there are check-ins and then there are project updates, and then when you may deal with issues in a particular way, then the role of the facilitator is just to make that clear and keep to the different steps and make sure that that, that process is followed. And if anybody steps out of that process is to bring people back into that process. Sure. So you can think of it as like, you know, a referee in that way. Mm -hmm. And that the referee doesn't really get involved in the football match. You know, they're, they're not involved in the, you know, apart from holding the rules, they're not involved in the game. Whereas the coaching is much more around supporting people to understand something about how the system works or different aspects of how the system work and the different rules and how to use the system and the different pathways in the system for processing their tensions or getting their work done or resolving things. And um, where it can be confusing sometimes is if the facilitator can get over involved as a coach, but without being clear when they're doing facilitation and when they're coaching, because that can be confusing for participants. And you can think of it as a bit like, well, the referee would, you know, like intercept a pass and then pass it to somebody else, pass the ball to somebody else. If that, that's when they might, that's the equivalent of starting to blur the boundary between facilitation and coaching. Interesting, interesting. So first thing I want to pick up on is kind of the way that you were talking about the facilitator from time to time. I think you might have used phrases like facilitator comes in and acts as a referee. Um, which to me 
means that the facilitator is a person that's maybe external to the group that they are facilitating. It's not so much a person that's already within the group and is taking on the role of a facilitator. Or can it be that as well? It can be either way. Hmm. So in systems like Holacracy or the self-organising system that XR UK has, I think it will in Holacracy the facilitator is a person who is within the circle, who's elected into the facilitator role. Uh -huh. And they're generally elected for a specific period of time and then that runs out and then they may get re-elected or somebody else gets elected. But they're there in the role of facilitator whilst also holding other roles in the circle that um, they hold. And then they then have to navigate the boundary around when am I showing up as a facilitator and when am I showing up in my roles? And is it possible to show up in both in the same meeting? Well, that's what facilitators do all the time, for example, in Holacracy. Okay. Um, if the facilitator is elected from one of the circle members who also holds other roles, then they're always showing up in different roles. Oh, interesting. Because I guess before you said that, I was thinking that it would be very, very difficult to do that. And therefore, an issue being if the facilitator is chosen from within the circle, they have to accept that all of their other kind of input is subsumed by their facilitator role. But you're saying that's actually not the case. They just need to manage the balance. It's a both and situation. Mm -hmm. So I can be both facilitator and in my other roles. And then I just need to be clear as facilitator of when I'm speaking as facilitator or when I'm speaking from one of my roles. And so one example of how you might do that is you might say, by default, I would be a facilitator in, in the process and, and hold the process. And then there would be times when I would say, in my role as, um, you know, meeting scheduler, or in my role as, you know, coach, my perspective <coughs> is this, and then being different, giving that different perspective. And some facilitators, when they're doing this, they will even say, if, if you're in a meeting room, they'll be standing up as facilitator and then they may sit down when they switch into a role or they may stand in a different position to like visually indicate with space which role and perspective they're taking. Okay, that's clever. That's very clever. So this is, I mean, I'm going to ask this even though I don't think there is an answer to it, but do you have a feeling as to whether having facilitators chosen from within the circle is better, worse, not much different than having a facilitator coming in from outside the circle? Mm. I don't think it's inherently better or worse. Mm. I think it depends a lot on two, two things, probably initially, this, the kind of facilitation that they're doing and that the system is using and also the, the skills and experience of the facilitator. Mm -hmm. Let me just unpack that a little bit. Yeah. So when I say the kind of facilitation they're doing, if I just contrast two very different types of facilitation. So one is more what might be called a more conventional facilitation where you're, um, you're there to listen to the people, to try and integrate and take on board the different voices and weave them together and reflect them back. And you're, you're there trying to um, provide a sense of inclusion mm -hmm. and helping people feel like they have the opportunity to speak and they have a voice. And you're facilitating the people in the room or in the meeting. So you're there, you're facilitating the people and trying to do all of those things. And I've done that for a very, very long time. And, you know, I always felt like it was an impossible job. It was always impossible to, to do it, you know, really, really well because there's too many things to pay attention to and to juggle. And somebody will often feel, you know, left out or like they weren't unheard or like their perspective was put down by another person's perspective and then they had their feelings hurt. And then it, that sets off a whole cascade. You know, you know, if you've been facilitating, you know, those kinds of things. And it's almost like, wow, that's an impossible job to facilitate people in that way where, everybody feels heard and there's that good sense of collaboration. You know, some people do it better than others. Mm -hmm. It's possible to, to do it 
well or badly, but it's all, I think ultimately impossible, or at least very, very difficult. Contrast that with the kind of facilitation that happens in something like Holacracy or the self-organizing system in XR UK, where all the facilitator is doing is more like a referee. And in, to use that analogy, the referee doesn't really care what the players are feeling. If one of the players is unhappy with what the referee did, the referee's like, well, I'm sorry about that, but I'm just, ho just holding the rules here. You know, I'm just playing by the rules. And you may have your emotional reaction, and you're free to have your emotional reaction, but that's not my business as facilitator because I'm holding the rules. And actually, for me to be seen by everybody else as neutral in holding this process, then I need to not really care about what you're feeling in this because if I start caring about what you're feeling about being upset about something and then somebody else is upset about something and then I need to start caring about that, that's going to undermine the neutrality of my role as facilitator. Whereas what I care about is holding to the process and in doing that, it's allowing people the space for their own emotional reactions and process and to be adults and grown up and to manage that themselves and to not really rely on anybody else to include them or deal with their, you know, feeling hey, it's to, re to rely on them to do that. And that's part of a, an underlying principle around self-organization, which is treating other people as adults and autonomous beings who can get what they need, speak up, look after themselves without a kind of paternal relationship from a facilitator having to look out for them or a boss or the organization having to look after them. So it's actually requiring that second style of facilitation that I'm talking about is requiring the facilitator to hold a, a different kind of stance to the more conventional facilitator. Mm -hmm. um, I feel, I have a question. I feel it like might take us down a bit of a path that I don't want us to spend too long on, but yeah. it's a very interesting one. I like the idea of treating people as adults and in an ideal world, yes great is everyone really there though can everyone and can we even assume that everyone really is capable of kind of looking after themselves and managing their own emotions because mm. i'm not i mean i i joined xr last year right but i've only been in I, I i don't know what they're called anymore i keep calling them national but in in air quotes national working groups i've only been in one for a couple of months now and i don't really know a lot of people but i hear that there are a lot of people tensions um and there's i hear the word lack of trust or the phrase lack of trust being used quite a lot so it feels to me that yeah that we're not at that level yet where people can actually do that yeah um i'm just thinking how to answer this i agree i'm yeah i'll answer this first i wanted to finish say something else tag it on to the end of what i was saying before but i'll i'll go down this one and then we might come back to that so absolutely yes and this is where an, an another kind of distinction is helpful to one that we may have conventionally which is and you've, you've named it already which is like you know the people the people stuff the people context the people space the people side of things the relational side of things and that it's an important part of self-organization practice to be able to differentiate and and not not separate but just notice the differences between when we're showing up in roles and working together and doing working in the organization and the operations and all those things and when we're showing up in our own personal capacity as people who have feelings who have histories who have emotional triggers from our past who are are having an emotional reaction to something that's happening that's to do with me as a person not so much to do with me in my role and what's going on in in the meeting right and yeah. the ability to, to to notice the difference between those two things means that when i'm in a meeting and i'm in a role and i'm having an emotional trigger about something i can hold the perspective of Here's, the, here's my role, here's the perspective I'm, here's the hat I'm wearing 
for my role. And so here's the perspective that I'm going to represent here and here's how I'm going to show up. And I know that I've got a trigger about this and it's, I've got all these feelings about it, but I'm going to deal with those in a different way and I'm not going to bring them into this meeting right now. And if I know that I have somewhere to take them and I know I have a pathway to work with that energy and what's happening and coming up in me, then I can hold it, put it on the shelf in the kind of you know business or operational meeting, the functional meeting. And then I can go into a different kind of space, a, a people space or an interpersonal relational space, and then deal with that, you know, with the person that it's come up with or go and talk to somebody else about it. And then um, process it in that way. And in that sense, the tensions and the issues that we feel in organizations and that we experience, they can be thought of as having these different dimensions. So they're all kind of wrapped up in the same, you know, something happens in a meeting and it's to do with a, it's to do with an event that's happening or it's to do with the situation. And I've got lots of feelings about it and I've got lots of work to do and I've got a, an issue, you know, a conflict come up, you know, and it's like, it's all tangled up in the same thing. Mm. But if we can think of, to start to untangle it, think of them in different spaces and this issue has these different aspects. So it has an operational aspect of here's the work I need to do around it, here's the task I need to do, here's the decision I need to, need to make. It may have a governance aspect around actually there's an unclear decision-making authority here and that needs to be cleared up using a governance process as an interpersonal aspect of me and you now have an issue between us because we have the we've having this clash and it maybe has a personal aspect of my own that um this is triggering something from my own personal history and i've got strong feelings about it and being able to to internally notice which one of those four there's like you can think of it as these those four different spaces um that the tension is alive in and differentiate them into those different aspects and then work with them in those ways this is coming from a model called language of spaces that you may have heard of that's yeah. it's one of the the methodologies that's helpful to use in self-organizing systems to be able to, dif to differentiate in that way so that's a long way of saying i get triggered in a meeting I don't act on it in the meeting. I know there's somewhere else I can take it and I go and deal with it afterwards, knowing that if I'm going to deal with it interpersonally, I would use a different pathway than I would in the meeting in a more operational context. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then if I can ask another question on this theme and it's around the knowing where to go. Mm. Um, it's great if the person knows where to go, but where does I don't want to, I don't like the word responsibility for some reason. Um, in whose power is it to to create and hold that space? Is it something for maybe a coach to do, or is it something that needs to sit outside of kind of that self organising systems sphere? Who? Yeah, who? Because because uh, if it was me, I wouldn't know at the moment. Mm. I have no idea. No. And I think you wouldn't know because within XR UK, I don't know if there are or what the pathways are for processing those kinds of issues. I understand there's a, I think it's called a conflict transformation team and a conflict transformation process. Um, so, <clears throat> and I don't know what that is. It might be if that, that's a particular uh, like one-to-one -one conflict as it's termed as a conflict that, if something comes up, I could go and talk to them or you could go and talk to them and see if you could get support doing that. Um, it may be that that doesn't quite um, meet the need mm -hmm. um, because I think that kind of process does meet some needs but doesn't need all of the thing, meet all of the things that come up mm -hmm. in the kind of thing we're talking about. And... I think that what that would point to is that maybe there needs to be other things in place as well to support processing all of the things that, that come up. Okay. So what I'm hearing is it's not in, in that kind of case, let's take the case of the example of personal tensions. Um, it's not the case that kind of an SOS expert, maybe a coach or someone else needs to help in processing that tension. It's really dependent on what processes, pathways, structures have been set up by the organisation to deal with that kind of thing. And they can be anything that work for the organisation. 
Yeah, yeah. And I would say that having all of those other processes to deal with all those different aspects of these tensions is an indicator of quite a mature self-organizing mm -hmm. practice. And say within XR UK, the self-organizing system in XR UK is not much more than a year old mm -hmm. and is really quite young. And as it currently stands, the self-organizing system and the team and the work in XR UK is mostly focused around the more operational and governance type of tensions of like getting the work done and less so on the personal and interpersonal dimensions yeah. and a more mature practice might not have them built in but will at least have like these um, apps or additional processes that would like dovetail or complement or fit okay. to support people in processing all these different aspects of the tensions okay cool thank you I'm conscious that you said before we got into this, you wanted to tack something on the end of what you were saying previously. Do you remember yeah. what it is? Yeah. Um, it was to, to come back to your answer, uh, question around, is it better to have a facilitator of somebody who's inside the circle or mm -hmm. independent or external from the circle? And so I started that by answering, it depends on the type of facilitation they do. And I talked about those two different types and then the skill of the facilitator. So in a more conventional facilitation where you are facilitating more the people and the feelings and things like that, then conventionally people are brought in and, more, are, and are more able to effectively facilitate if they're independent because their independence yeah. supports the neutrality. Whereas if they're embedded in a web of relationships, it un can undermine the neutrality. Whereas if they're a neutral referee and all they're doing is holding to the rules, it's much easier for them to be within the circle and just say, oh, I'm just holding to the rules and I'm just facilitating the process. Okay, okay. So that's why there's that distinction. That's why in self-organizing systems, people are more elected from within a team because the role and stance of the facilitator is different. So that's the first piece. And the second piece is the skill of the facilitator is like how well are they, are they able to manage that boundary and differentiation of when they're in facilitator role and then when they're in their own roles. And that's a piece of work that they do internally in terms of their own self-awareness internally of what they're doing and then being able to be clear about that and express that externally. Okay, cool. So, um, I'm going to bring this into kind of the real world right now. So within XR, um, we have this embedded SOS coach role. And the, the purpose as written of that role is something along the lines of to guide circles within XR, XR UK to become self-sufficient in their use of the self-organizing system. Um, so based on taking that and taking what you've just said, I can see a scenario where a coach goes into a circle, does actual coaching, not maybe facilitation as well, um, but they do coaching. And once they leave, then individuals within the circle feel confident enough to take on the role of facilitator, uh, that kind of referee type role on an ongoing basis. Um, now I know uh, it was, it was yesterday, gosh, it feels like an age ago. Um, someone said that that idea around circles becoming self-sufficient in the use of the SOS seems quite overambitious. Um, they didn't qualify whether they mean now or whether they mean in perpetuity. Um, our, our discussion, what we've said just now, would seem to indicate the opposite, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts around that. Do you think it's realistic that circles would eventually be able to self-manage within the self-organizing system yeah yeah i think i agree and i think that's the goal uh, but i think it's probably more a matter of just the amount of time that can be expected for that to take and i think someone was was mentioning that you know if there's a two-week intervention where a coach will go in and coach a circle for two weeks and then come out i don't think it's realistic to expect a circle to become self-sufficient in their self-organizing practice in two weeks 
is more likely to be a period of months. Um, and I think the two week thing may have come about literally just due to lack of resources of there's such a demand from so many circles on XR SOS coaches that they can just do two weeks at a time and then go off and do somewhere else. And that's probably better than nothing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. That really helps actually. Mm. So yeah, can we, can we talk more about coaches themselves? Cause we talked a lot about facilitators and facilitation. Um, I mean, personally, I have no experience of, I've, I've been to lots of meetings and I've witnessed some really excellent facilitation, um, but I've never actually witnessed any coaching. Um, what is what is coaching? What is coaching? What form can coaching take? Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of different forms in a lot of different contexts and different ways. But in this context, it's helping people to understand um, what the self-organizing system is, how it works, um, the rules of it and how to um, understand tensions mm -hmm. what tensions are and then how different pathways that are available to process their tensions okay. um, and it can bring about shifts for people as, as a coach the kind of things that i pay attention to bringing about are in uh, what's called four quadrants the integral quadrants if you're familiar with the integral theory but um so they may bring about shifts like internally in someone's own internal world and their worldview their own understanding of the world mm -hmm. um you know for example the kind of shift we spoke about about the, the way a facilitator shows up in their stance so internally it may bring around shifts in behavior uh, of how the things a person does and how they behave it may bring about around shifts in in a group culture uh, with the feel, the norms or assumptions or the um, practices that happen in a group, or it may bring about changes in actual an actual structure or an actual system um, with procedures and policies and rules and things like that. And so I'm, I'm paying attention when I'm coaching, I'm paying attention to, you know, which one of those um, might somebody need help with. Um, and again, they might there'd be four aspects. You know, one thing might have aspects of all of those four things. Okay, interesting. Um, when uh, at the weekend, I was so one of the things that we did a few weeks ago was we talked to some of the coaches, um, our existing embedded SOS coaches, the role holders, um, just to get some feedback on what they were doing, how they felt it was going, what they thought the challenges were, so on and so forth. Um, and at the weekend, I was trying to kind of put together we've got a summary of it and I was trying to put together something like our thoughts, our, our statement of what we're going to do now that we have that information. And one of the things that I wrote down, I want to run it past you, is that the coach has a responsibility to nurture the psychological and cultural shift needed for the XR organism to embody self-organisation and become self-sufficient in that. Do you agree with that? I'd, I'd say broadly, yes. Um, I'd put it in slightly different terms, um, a slightly shorter term. The, the kind of term that's used in a lot of self-organizing work is this idea of power shift. Okay. Um, and I think that's just a, a more compact way of saying what you just said. Uh, the idea of, of reaching, helping. So in terms of a, what a coach's role might be, in, a, in the power shift is to help people understand different ways that power can be used in a self-organizing system and that it shifts away from ways that we're conventionally used to power being used which is in a top-down hierarchy where people have power over each other to tell each other what to do and there's leadership but there's a limited amount of power which increases as you go up the hierarchy and if somebody takes it then it's removed from somebody else you know power is like a finite resource is like shifting the attitude and stance and understanding of power into actually being this infinite resource that everybody has and it, the self-organizing system creates the conditions where everybody can realize their their own potential to be empowered and to, to use their power within the system and that is not something 
they don't need to be given permission to do things or to ask what to do or to get approval that the the rules and structures of the self-organizing system create the conditions and the boundaries for people to take action and be autonomous and do what they need to do and balance that with certain constraints but to be able to um, act in those ways and that's a fundamental shift in how people feel empowered and how they relate to power and so part of the role of the coach is to help help like usher and transition people through that power shift and how how do you how do you actually achieve that again this one might not have kind of a, a silver bullet answer but how do you actually achieve a shift like that do you, other than kind of taking a specific issue that someone's facing and demonstrating how it can be dealt with is there any other way because I guess while that seems very neat and useful and practical, um, it could take for a single circle years to end up dealing with all of the issues that crop up as they, as they work. Mm. So this is where uh, a good combination of facilitation and coaching can help because a facilitator will, will model that power shift in terms of how they facilitate a meeting if there's a self-organizing system in place that has a set of rules that creates conditions for autonomy and balancing with constraints and those things when they're facilitating a meeting they're they're adhering to their set the set of rules and they're um helping like move people along through the process according to that set of rules so they're they're embodying that they're modeling it and they're demonstrating it and then when people get stuck or they get confused then a facilitator can pause, you know, and generally in the meeting, you'll take a time out and say, oh, this is a good opportunity for some coaching. Let me help you understand what's going here, what's going on here. You know, in this situation, um, you don't have to ask for permission um, or approval to make this decision because actually it's in your, um, the mandate of your role already, but you may want to get some input around that. And so you're helping somebody get some understanding of of how things work when they're in a role and and how where their decision making authority lies and how to process something if they get stuck and helping them understand how those things work i mean i could carry on talking but let me just pause does does, does that make sense or does that answer what you were asking or what's not left answered I, I, well, it's, it's, it's a start anyway. I don't, at this point, I, I'm not going to pursue that further because, yeah, you, I'm, I'm satisfied. Okay. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, of course, I'm very new at this and I'm the sort of person that wants to learn everything right away and I know that's not possible. So I do have to restrain myself and try and take time over these things. Um, but something has, has just popped into my head which I would like to put to you as well. Um, recently I've heard a couple of people say that or comment that the way the self-organizing system is set up with roles, mandates, processes can feel quite inhumane sometimes. Uh, maybe, maybe inhumane is the wrong way of saying it, it just, it, it lacks humanity. I know that's kind of like a very, very fine distinction. Um, but yeah, it's kind of taking, taking away from the people in service to the system. And for some reason, as we've been talking, I didn't, it didn't resonate with me a lot. But as we've been talking, it has started to. So do you have any comment on that? This, like I am, I'm quite a process driven person. I like the reliance on the process, but yeah, I actually, you know where it comes from? I was on a call earlier today. It was not XR at all. It was around, um, uh, food systems in the UK and a lady who set up an organization called Incredible Edible was saying that what um, they have done is they haven't waited 
for government and policy makers to develop policy around sustainable food systems or encouraging people to kind of grow their own food. They went out onto the streets and they started talking to people. They started spreading the message that way. They really engaged. And that's when I kind of thought, oh, that sounds amazing. Are we doing that in XR? I'm not totally sure that we are. So it's, th it's those two things that are kind of coming together in my mind to make me ask this question. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'm wondering which part of that to answer first. Um, yeah, sorry, that was quite long. Yeah, that's all right. Let me just see what's the best thing to say to that. Um, I think I'll start with the first bit first. So a lot of people say with a system like the XR UK self-organising system that it's inhumane and seems to lack that more kind of personal sense. And that's that is actually intentional because of the kind of distinction that I was talking about at the big start of the call around the different aspects. Sorry, I just see you talking to someone. Are you okay? Sorry, can you repeat that? There's some commotion going on at the front door. Can you just hang on one second? Sure, yeah. That's all right. Um, yeah, sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah. So I was saying that the it's often said around self-organizing systems that with, with an emphasis on roles and process and structure that it, it can be feel inhumane and that is actually intentional by design because of what I was saying at the start of the call about noticing the distinction between more workspace and more people in relational space and that I think a lot of us are very familiar with what happens when we confuse and conflate those two things together. And, you know, there's an idea within teal organizing or this more kind of progressive way of working in organizations. Just, oh, you know, we bring our whole, our whole person to work. You know, we show up as whole people. Um, which is great. It brings that sense of wholeness and people being able to feel more fulfilled and more engaged. And if it's done without kind of boundaries and, and things, it can get very, very messy very quickly. Because, you know, if I show up in my wholeness, then I bring my baggage with me and I bring my shadow and I bring my young inner self into the, the room who will then start acting out in some ways. And it's like, well, I'm just being whole. I'm just being authentic here and whole, you, you know. But you're trying to run a meeting and get some work done. And... I don't know about you, but I've been in organizations and situations where all of that's been welcomed and, you know, the whole of you is welcome and bring everything, you know, all feelings and everything's accepted and welcome. And it's great in terms of having a very whole experience, but it's not great for actually being effective at getting very much work done because of very often getting derailed by the personal and interpersonal stuff that comes up from the personal stuff that surfaces. Yeah. So because of that, it's not prioritizing or biasing one over the other. It's not saying, well, let's preference the personal or interpersonal over the work, or let's preference the work over the interpersonal, which is what often happens. Often you'll get a bias in an organization for one over the other. Mm -hmm. It's about, well, let's try and differentiate those two and work with them in an integrated way. Is this movement of differentiation and integration. So let's notice that actually they're different things and they can be processed in different ways. And let's keep the work stuff in a work meeting where there are roles. I'm showing up in a role and I'm following a meeting process where there's a neutral facilitators, referee, and where there's a policy that has these certain constraints. And I'm getting triggered, but I know I'm going to deal with that in a different space after the meeting. And um, so the whole of me can show up, but my shadow material isn't going to sabotage the work that we're trying to do together. And that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning around, you know, treating people like grown-ups. It's like we're providing the, 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 the context for people to take responsibility for themselves, which is another key principle of self-organizing. And yeah. to not bring in that paternal relationship, parental relationship is 
yep, you know, you're an adult, you look after yourself and you manage your own things. And we have a space and a process to support dealing with the difficult interpersonal stuff, but we're going to do it in a differentiated way and not at the same time in the middle of a business meeting. Mm -hmm. And so young, um, kind of novice self-organizing practice tends to preference one of those over the other. They will tend to preference and bias. Let's just do the structure and the process and the meetings. And of course it's inhuman because it's leaving out the other part or it's biasing and preferencing against it. Whereas a mature practice will have a, a set of pathways for processing the other stuff and it's balanced. It's differentiated, but it's also it works in a very whole way. And I've worked in organizations that are practicing self-organization, but um, that can really work. You know, it really works. We're in a meeting and stuff comes up and someone says, well, I really need, you know, something's really come up for me around this and I know I'm going to need to process it later. But in my role as X, Y, Z, here's what needs to happen, or here's what I think, or here's what I want input on, or here's how I'm going to process this. Um, I'm glad that you said that in um, younger self-organizing systems or kind of SOS type organizations, um, there will usually be a bias towards the work or the personal one or the other. And because before you said that, I was going to say, yeah, I'm not sure we have that personal space with an extinction rebellion. But I guess we're, we're probably not alone in that. And, and it's not that, that it's going to stay that way forever. Um, I guess even once I've said that, though, the issue is I think that a lot of people, and uh, how I described myself earlier, wanting to kind of know everything now, wanting things to be available and perfect now, um, and there are many times when I've reminded myself, it's only been a year for the self-organising system, maybe 18 months or what for, for Extinction Rebellion. This is a process we're on. And there's no way it's going to be perfect um, to begin with. I don't know how many other people really try and remind themselves of that. And I do wonder if that's where a lot of attention comes from. Everyone just wants, because of course, we have a self-organising systems team who I think most people look to to get all of this done because they're planning actions or they're trying to develop our regenerative cultures or they're dealing with arrest welfare. They've got their own stuff to deal with. Um, and the system, I guess, is taken... Not taken... It, it, it's taken as something that should be foundational and, and sorted so that they can get on with the other stuff. Yeah. And it's yeah. not. It's not. And I see that also as part of the role of coaching mm. is to help um, help people shift out of a stance of expecting things to be like complete and perfect and resolving all the problems into more of a kind of, it's, it's a bit like a paradigm shift or a shift in worldviews to a, a way of seeing the world where everything's imperfect nothing's complete and this is always only ever going to be an experiment mm -hmm. and we're just always taking the next step of refining the experiment and fixing this and in that sense um, tensions are to be welcomed tensions are the latest indicator of oh here's the area of the system where there's a bit of tension and something that could be improved or isn't quite working, where we can go and give it some attention and, and see how that could be processed. And not necessarily fixed, but resolved in a way that's good enough for now. Oh, and then there's another tension over here. And great, you know, you, let's see what opportunity that ho holds for improving the system. So it's, it's coming to a place of, of kind of continual experimentation and trying things out and then welcoming the tensions as opportunities to do that rather than expecting it to be complete and whole and fixed and complaining when it isn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was listening to um, a recording of um, a call that Mickey Kashtan did. Um, I can't remember when the call was actually recorded, but one of the people on that quoted her as saying something like, tensions aren't shit, they're compost. Mm. Um, and we need to change people's thinking from the former part of that statement to the latter part of that statement yeah and yeah I, I liked that i liked that i've remembered that i think i've written it down somewhere 
That's an elegant way of putting it. <laughs> if a little blue <laughs> language. But it, it represents a, a, a shift in worldview, mm. um, yeah. which is part of the role of the coach, is to help mm. help people, you know, you can you can demonstrate you can try and explain it, but it's much more powerful if you demonstrate it mm. by using the pathways that are available in the self-organizing system to help them resolve attention and actually have the embodied experience of oh i had an issue and i used this pathway and now that issue is resolved and now this thing works really well or it's mm. been this issue has been resolved and it's like oh this is how the self-organizing system works mm. okay cool cool right one I, I have one more question, see where it takes us. This one's quite a, quite a practical one, I think. Um, any ideas on how you coach people that just want to get stuff done? There are too many meetings, there's so much going on, we're all gonna potentially die very soon, we have got to get work done. How, how do you coach in that kind of environment? Because it takes time, doesn't it? It takes time of everyone and commitment as well. Mm. Mm. so the approach that i take to that is to be very hands-off and not to try and you know like push anything onto people and oh this is the process that we need to use but it's to be quite hands-off but kind of they're accompanying them in their work and you know to let them know that i'm there and then that i'm there to support them when there's something in their way. Mm -hmm. So they want to get stuff done, but you know, with a, with a bias towards action and a preferencing for action, you know, it's great. You can get a lot of stuff done, but if you're not balancing it out and attending it with process and structure, then you often come up with obstacles, you know, with other people or with things that, that get in the way. And when that happens, I'm, I'll just be there to, to help, um address that issue and process it by bringing in a bit of process or structure and by and in doing that then like not tell them but just help usher them along of here's how this thing works you know um i couldn't i couldn't do this thing before and now i can do it because uh, I've I've paid attention to a little bit of process and put that in place. Okay. So it's really working with what's there, and the you know working with the energy that they have, and then when it gets stuck, it's helping them unblock that energy. And the only way to do it is often by a little bit of structure and process, and by doing that step by step, and then reflecting back to them over time of oh look in how we've used this structure and process to. Um, resolve these things might help them then bring about a bit of kind of balance between the action and and process polarity you know maybe not within themselves but maybe within a team then because yeah, yeah. that polarity often exists with both within people and also within teams mm. okay that's really useful thanks mm. Is, I've run out of questions. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> Nothing else? <laughs> no, not that I can think no. of right now. Okay. Do you want to offer any kind of reflection at the end to kind of close out before we stop around? Has this been useful? What are you left with? Um, where might you go next? Um, it's been really useful. It's been it's been fantastically useful, in fact. Um, I hope you'll let me share the recording with other people in the team um so that anyone that's interested can watch this um yeah your your insight as someone that has worked in this area for a long time is invaluable particularly to someone like me who is learning about a specific kind of self-organizing system and the processes that are involved but hasn't yet got to that point of really in-depth thinking about the whys um, 
and, and, and maybe what, even what it is we're trying, we can achieve, not, not what we're trying to achieve, what we can achieve through this. So it's so great to get that perspective on how, how this could work, and what we could do with it. Um, I was originally going to take notes as we went along. I decided not to because I just wanted to have the conversation. I think I'll probably be listening again so I can pull out specific things that I can, um, that I can try and use. Um, because there was lots, there was lots in there. Um, so yeah, thank you. Mm. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. I'm, I'm glad to be of help and happy if you want to invite other members as well to these calls and can happy to build capacity with the team as I can. Cool. I had one response already. She couldn't make it today because she had another call, but hopefully she'll be here next month. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll stop the recording now. Thanks. Cool.